Hi everybody, welcome to Simply Scuba and welcome to Ask Mark where I answer all of your scuba diving questions or at least do my best to. Uh, if you've got any questions that you want me to just chat about really, uh, let me know down in the comments below and if you use the hashtag Ask Mark, uh, it just sort of pops it up on a list on my screen behind the scenes uh, so I know to talk about it next week. Uh, this week we're talking about travel BCDs, uh, dive computers beeping, uh, helium, uh, dive lights, dive torches, uh, masks fogging up and BCD maintenance. Interesting. So let's jump straight into the first question, which this week comes from, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Marta, Ray, Marta Ray QT. I'm guessing that is. Uh, and they say, hello again. And here comes a comparison slash matter of choice question. I'm in need of a travel BCD. A full-blown wing and aluminium wing is not my preferred option, as I really want something light. I used to have an Aqualung Zuma, which I loved, but it didn't have enough lift capacity. Now I'm diving a Hydros Pro from Scuba Pro, but it isn't really a travel-friendly BCD. I do like the looks of the Aqualung Rogue and the Outlaw, but really don't know if I were to choose which one to go for. So if you were to decide between those two, which one would you go for? Uh, and if there's another alternative that's comparable regarding lift capacity, uh, soft back plate and overall very low weight. Uh, I'm a size small, dive in a wetsuit and a dry suit, don't need pockets as I've mastered the Christmas tree approach to accessories uh, and definitely don't want jacket style BCD. Any opinion or advice? Yeah, so the um, uh, the Scuba Pro, the Hydros Pro, yeah, it is not really a travel BCD because all that monoprene is actually deceptively heavy. Um, the Zuma, yeah, the Zuma was definitely travel friendly. That was specifically what it was made for. Uh, I used to dive something similar called the Oceanic Biolite. Similar design, just different brand, but it was designed, it stripped out very um, sort of slimline. Um, the Zuma was like 22 pounds of, um, of lift. Um, so if you need a bit more then the Outlaw, the Outlaw has two versions, um, depending on where you are, because here in the UK, unless they've changed it, we can only get hold of the 25 pound bladder. I think there is a 12 pound version. Um, but for whatever reason, we can only get hold of the 25, um, out here. I think you can get hold of the uh, the smaller version, but it's quite special order. It's, it's not something that your dive center would hold in stock. Um, but yeah, the Outlaw does have a little bit more buoyancy uh, if you go for the 25 pound uh, option. I think it's a little bit lighter. The Zuma was like just over two kilos. The Outlaw is just under two kilos. I think it's about 1.8. Um, so that's definitely an option for you. The Rogue, Rogue is a bit of a beefed up version of the Outlaw. Um, that has 35 pounds of lift, um, but I think that's, again, just over two kilos of weight. It's not it's not heavy BCD. It's probably about the same as the Zuma, um, but yeah, it is definitely a, um, an option for you. Choosing between the two. So for me personally, I'd probably just go for the Outlaw because I don't need like the the pockets and the stuff on the um on the rogue they're okay but personally i'd never really use them uh, i tend to use thigh pockets uh, wherever i'm diving um so that's an option for you i mean if your dive center has the patience and you've got the time um then because they use the same uh, what's it called mod lock those like circular uh, articulated joints the rogue and the outlaw use the same so you could by the individual components you can get an outlaw an outlaw backplate um, or a rogue backplate and get the outlaw waistband clip the outlaw waistband to the rogue backplate i believe um i don't see why not because it's the same fitting and so yeah you can really chop and change and mix and match but it's really something that has to be done there and then um and buying the individual components probably isn't the cheapest way of doing it it's easier just to buy that complete set um but if buoyancy is an issue and 22 pounds wasn't enough chances are that 25 pounds probably won't be enough neither in the outlaw so the rogue seems to make the most sense um and it's still not heavy um i think it weighs about the same as the zoomer it's like two 
two and a bit, 2.2 kilos. It depends on size, but if you're a small, then it's gonna be on the lower end, so two and a bit kilos. Um, otherwise, they're pretty similar. Um, it's, it's mainly down to the, the wing size in it. So yeah, go, go for the Rogue. But personally, I'd go for the Outlaw just because um, I, I do my best not to overweight myself. The only reason, because you should have no gas in your uh, in your bladder whilst you're actually on the dive. It's only when you're on the surface when you actually want some, um, some of that positive buoyancy. Um, but if you're carrying a lot of gear or whatever and you need that lift when you're actually in the water, um, then the, the Rogue makes the most sense. LJ Gillerance says, Hi Mark, I have a good old Scuba Pro Mantis dive computer and I'm thinking about upgrading to something with a transmitter. All computers are capable of beeping. Yep, tell me about it. Uh, and of course, they continuously monitor a lot of parameters. However, I don't seem to find a computer let me program when I want it to beep. Uh, the use for what I want is to do is to tell my computer to beep when my NDL is at two minutes, for instance. Or if I have a transmitter, wanted to beep when my tank is at 100 bar or 65 or whatever. Um, even more interesting would be a computer like the Garmin where I can monitor two or more tanks at once. It would be awesome if I could tell it to beep if anyone in the group reaches 100 bar. No cheating mode activated. Cheers, LJ. Uh, well, good news, you, you can do this. Um, dive computer Computers, you can set um, sort of various alarms on dive computers. I don't know about the NDL, you know, decompression limit. I don't think I've ever seen that on a dive computer where you can say, when my NDL is down to two minutes, um, set it off. I don't think I've ever seen that. Someone might be able to uh, sort of put uh, put it down in the comments below, but personally, I, I've never seen it. But as far as wireless air integration, yeah. Um, I mean, my Sunto D6, before it was the D6i or the D6i Novo, um, or whatever it is today, that could do it. Um, my Shearwater does that as well. You can, you can select it so that, yeah, when, when it gets down to a certain tank pressure, it just alerts you, so you push a button um, just to uh, sort of ignore it or whatever. Um, if you're diving with, they can also dive with multiple transmitters. Um, my Perdix AI, you can have multiple transmitters and it can display both at the same time. The trouble that you're gonna come up with is range. Uh, ranges on transmitters are pretty short to like one, maybe two meters. So if you're diving with a whole group, that gets tricky. There was the, uh, Liquivision Lynx, that had pretty good range and that could connect to like 10 different transmitters. Um, so that was quite good for like dive guides. It wasn't the cheapest computer and then you've got to buy 10 transmitters as well and you've got to pair them all up and name them and it was just more hassle than it's worth. But I think that one could, it's, it's a relatively old computer. I don't know if they still produce it. Um, I imagine Ratio uh, do something like that as well because they're almost like the, the successor to um, um, Liquivision. I think Liquivision are still about, but um, but then they're not as big as like the Suntos and the Shearwaters and the Garmins and stuff. Um, but yeah, Sunto computers, I think the, um, uh, the, the Eon Steel, that can connect to like, 10, maybe even 20, because I think with a new Eon Steel Black, I think that can connect to 20 transmitters nowadays. Um, but again, it, it's all gonna come down to range. So unless you're right next to them, um, then it's just gonna come down to uh, sort of trust. But um, but yeah, that, that's not an unusual setting to be able to um, sort of go into your computer settings, go into alerts, and then you'll have um, a tank pressure alert or something. Um, some might even have gas time remaining. So a lot of dive computers, when they're air integrated, they work out based on your depth, your breathing rate, and your remaining gas, how many minutes of air you have left. And I, I imagine some have it so that if you get down to 20 minutes or whatever, you pick and choose, it will alert you. And then as you change depth, of course the number will change. But, um, but yeah, they, they do exist. I don't think it exists for um, for no decompression limit. I think it is just, it, some will probably give you like a yellow warning when you get close 
Uh, and then others are just going to be, nah, bump, you, you've reached NDL, you have to do some kind of deco stop or something. So, um, but I don't think I've ever seen in settings where you can pick and choose three minutes of NDL, um, let me know. Uh, another common one is dive time. So from the time that you went under the water, that was quite useful for dive guide as well because you could pick and choose your, um, your turn time. Um, or I used to use it to remind myself to just check everybody's um, sort of pressure. So after, I think it was like 30 minutes or something, I just sort of get a little notification, oh, you've been diving for 30 minutes, okay. And then you just turn around and ask everyone how much uh, sort of pressure they have. Um, but physically having a list on your wrist and sort of watching everyone, yeah, I think it mainly is coming down to range and a lot of transmitters nowadays don't have amazing ranges. And if you've got 10 transmitters as well, they're all going to be like broadcasting at the same time um, and they're going to just create interference. That's why the Shearwater Swift transmitter uh, is quite clever because it's, 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 it's a polite transmitter. It's, it listens out for other transmitters broadcasting and if it hears someone else broadcasting, it won't, it'll hold back. And then when it hears that it's nice and clear and it's not gonna interfere with anyone, then it starts broadcasting. So that's quite smart. So you'd need that kind of technology so you don't have like 10 transmitters all broadcasting at the same time. Bloody Marvelous says, how do you feel about a helium release valve on a dive watch? Um, don't really have any feelings about it at all. Um, I, I feel that a lot of people don't really know what a helium release valve does, um, or if they have it on their, their watch, they don't really need it unless they're like a proper saturation diver. So you'll often see on a lot of like 1000 meter dive watches or something, you'll have a helium release valve, which is just, you get the, uh, the crown, the, um, the screw, they, they sort of screw in on, uh, on dive watches or they should do. But on one of them, you'll just have one that screws out and then screws back in. It doesn't really do anything. That's a helium release valve. So if you're saturation diving, you're going to like 200 meters plus and you're in a helium rich environment so that you can breathe. Um, if you look up uh, saturation divers and um, sort of listen to them talk, it's hilarious. It sounds like the chipmunks uh, because they're breathing that, um, that helium rich mix. But helium is quite a slippery gas um, and it gets into the working parts of your watch. And because you're down at incredible depths, it's compressed. So it sort of infiltrates inside of your watch, but then as you're coming back up, it starts to expand and it can't fit through those little gaps that it found its way into, and then it just over expands and then it damages your watch. So saturation divers will have that helium release valve so that you can open it up and allow the helium to escape. Obviously you can't do it when you're wet because that's just gonna let water in. This is only for if you're in like a, a bell or some kind of chamber. Um, so most recreational divers are never going to need it. We did have it before where um, someone was buying it for their husband or something. And of course they were asking, oh, okay, if I buy this, um, how do you, um, how do you like replenish the helium? And it's like, no, it is the opposite. The watch isn't full of helium. Um, we want to get rid of the helium. If anything, that's what the release valve does. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> For just recreational diving, it's, it is a failure point. As long as you don't fiddle with it, as long as the seal is good, um, then it should be perfectly fine. But um, yeah, it, it's a little bit uh, sort of overkill if you're, um, if you're getting it just to dive to like 30 meters or something. Um, but for saturation divers, yeah, it, it's quite essential so you don't damage your, um, your watch. But um, yeah, that, I've, they don't offend me in, uh, in any way. You just have to use it properly. DVN Ultimate asks, hi Mark, could you please give advice on dive lights? For example, minimum lumens, uh, spot versus wide, or go with zoom, burn time, etc. I'm looking to buy my first dive torch for recreational diving, mostly for night dives, otherwise in the pocket for safety. Um, would be a Mares EOS 10 LRZ or 20 LRZ or a SIAC 40R be overkill? Uh, lastly, what do you think about the soft Goodman handles? Thanks in advance. Um, yeah, so 
for just night dives uh, in clear blue waters, uh, say like in the Red Sea or something, my usual um, sort of go-to is somewhere between like 500 and 700 lumens. Uh, that's kind of my sweet spot. Anything over, and it, I just find it, it gets a bit dazzling, uh, especially if you shine it on the sand because then the white sand just reflects back and then it ruins your night vision. Um, with my like 700 lumen torch, I usually cover the um, the front of it anyway with my fingers so that I can sort of open and uh, and sort of let a bit more light out if I need to. But yeah, sort of 500 is um, is sort of perfectly fine. If you're diving in murkier waters, so here in the UK, I tend to go up to like a thousand, probably two thousand. It's one of those things where I'd rather have too much than not enough something a bit like that. Um, because if I'm diving here in the UK and I've got my um, uh, my sort of big torch, then it's rare that I'll actually have it set to its full power um, because it's kind of like putting your full beam on your car in a snowstorm. It, it will just illuminate everything in front of you and it almost makes it murkier. So I tend to have it set to lower settings. Um, but yeah, 1000 lumens, that's kind of a sweet spot and a lot of torches nowadays especially if they have buttons uh they'll have different power settings so you'll have like 1000 and then it'll have a 50 percent and then a 10 percent or something um if it's just a a screw head or something it's usually on or off so full power or nothing at all with those eos ones from mares they're fantastic because you have that sort of pushy switch to adjust the power settings but also you have the adjustable beam angles so it's the best of both worlds. If you only get the choice of spotlight or floodlight, I'd go with spotlight. Um, floodlights are nice, but really they, they just kind of illuminate everything. And a lot of the light is just kind of lost. They're great for photos and videos because they're illuminating everything nice and evenly. But for everyday diving, spotlight. It's much easier to communicate. Um, you're not gonna be um, sort of made a, a social pariah because with floodlights, if you, if you shine it like even off, in front of someone it's still shining at them whereas the spotlight is just pointing where you're pointing it so um yeah people don't like it when you um uh, when you dive with a, a floodlight in front of them um and yeah just spotlight light anywhere between like 10 and 15 degrees or something is pretty standard for a uh, for a spotlight beam but with those maras eos runs uh, you, you adjust the head and it, it can swap between the two what you'll probably find yourself doing is having it set to spotlight more often um and sometimes you you might want to just illuminate an entire scene so you just do it in the water and then you get a uh, floodlight but yeah 10 rz or the 20 rz so the 10 rz isn't 1000 lumens it's like 1100 lumens uh the 20 r l r z is 2300 lumens i think um they they used to be nice and neat the 10 had a thousand the 20 had 2000 but now they've uh, improved it with the l r z um so uh, so they're a little bit higher 10 rz will do you quite quite fine uh my backup torch is um is a 1000 lumens um torch you don't want anything overly bulky because you're going to be stowing it away in a pocket or clipping it off onto onto your harness but um but as far as power settings go yeah the 10 rz will do sort of perfectly fine especially in like red sea night dive kind of territory and then yeah in um sort of diving here in the uk during the daytime yeah, you probably do pretty well with uh, with 1,000 lumens. As far as soft Goodman handles, yeah, I, I use one on my uh, on my primary dive torch. I like that they uh, they work basically. They work with gloves. They work with bare hands. Whereas the uh, the the traditional like Spartan U shaped handle, they're, they're all very well and good, but they're kind of basic and when it's not kind of fit perfectly and you've got to use tools and stuff, then it kind of rocks backwards and forwards, which is a bit of a pain, especially if you're just wearing um, sort of bare hands, it can kind of rub on your knuckles. But with a soft Goodman handle, it is usually Velcro. So you just adjust it. You can adjust how it sort of fits around there. You get the second strap that goes around the back. So it's really, it's fit onto your hands. So even if you do kind of shake it, it's not going anywhere compared to a rigid Goodman handle that 
yeah, it, it, if you did sort of make a flat hand and just did that, it would slide off. Whereas a, um, a soft Goodman handle, most of them have a second strap that kind of wraps around the back of your thumb to really hold it in uh, sort of nice and secure. So yeah, I, I use one all the time. Jake Reese uh, says, I'm looking into options for masks to not fog up. Uh, normally it's not a problem, but when I forget to shave, I get fogging problems from clearing too much. The Cressy A1 seems great, but I assume the anti-fog coating wears off after time, especially if it gets scratched. So maybe the Cressy Quantum is a better long-term option. Just concerned all of the extra seals and membranes will make clearing difficult. Uh, thanks and keep up the good work. I will do my best. Uh, yeah, yeah, I forget to shave from time to time. Um, and um, and yeah, it does mean that you do have to clear a little bit more often. Um, so the Cressy A1 has a an internal coating. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what it is, to be honest. Um, but uh, I don't actually know the, the, the long-term effects of it. Um, on just like using it day to day. Uh, I honestly don't know. I have on my backup mask, I have one of those films um that kind of sticks to the inside of the lens just so that i don't have to defog it before every dive um and if i ever have to sort of use it it's kind of pre-defogged because of that film and touch wood um it works perfectly fine and that's come on hundreds of dives um i don't know whether it's a similar kind of treatment on the uh, on the a1 um yeah i did read which i think was um sort of what you're referring to in the um uh, in your question that someone bought an a1 mask and then without thinking uh pre-treated it with toothpaste and scratched that treatment off um yeah don't do that um read the manuals and toothpaste is fairly abrasive as well so do be incredibly careful um, because it can affect lens treatment so don't ever do that the quantum the quantum is a new one and that uses a kind of mechanical sense it has a heat sink built into the skirt it's uh, it's kind of ribbed on the on sort of, sort of the section around that's increasing the surface area to volume ratio to actually help prevent the mask from fogging up kind of mechanically. It also has a second internal skirt just over the top of your nose. So um, yeah, that probably would be the better option. I don't think you're gonna have an issue with it clearing because as much as it is a seal, as, as long as you're breathing out through your nose, it is gonna naturally um, sort of displace it because the air will go to the highest point and it's not gonna be a perfect hermetic seal around your, uh, around your nose. So I wouldn't worry about clearing it or anything, um, but it does work because I tried it with the um, Calibro mask and I've got a brand new Calibro mask straight out of the box. And normally, as, as soon as you look into it, um, a mask will uh, will kind of fog up. But I put it on and I just breathed out through my nose and it took a long, long time for it to even start to fog up. So now that you have the uh, the quantum, that like heat sink uh, sort of ribs around the side as well, that's gonna help it. So that's probably gonna be the, um, the better choice. And, personally what I'd go for just because like chemical treatments or whatever it is magic surface tension things yeah they're good but I, yeah as soon as they come out you almost want someone else to have had it for 10 years time but of course when it's brand new you can't have that and you don't want to find out in three or four years time that uh, actually you know what uh, it, it does start to wear off I can't promise it does or doesn't um, because I haven't personally used it myself um, but between those two, I'd probably go for the Quantum just because it's, it's mechanical. Uh, it's not a, uh, a special lens treatment. Ido Lempert says, do you bother to fill the BCD uh, with fresh water after every dive? If so, what is the best method to do that? Thank you. Um, not after every single dive. Um, I'll, I'll flush it out after a day's diving, um, just so it's not sitting there with uh, sort of salt water or contaminated water um, for any length of time. But if I'm diving like two or three times a day, I'm not gonna wash it out completely between dives because it's only gonna be a couple of hours. Um, depending, it depends on the water. If I know that the water is particularly contaminated, then yeah, um, I probably would, um, but it's it's quite circumstantial. If I'm just diving in the Red Sea uh, or diving sort of off the coast here, 
I'm, I'm not too worried because I know that the water is quite uh, sort of clean unless I'm diving near certain outlets or something, in which case I probably wouldn't be diving there anyway. But no, it, if the water is nasty, then yeah, to be honest, I probably would. But for normal recreational diving in like the Red Sea or somewhere where the water is relatively clean, no, I, I don't wash it out between dives, but after a day's diving, I probably would. One thing that I do tend to do after a dive is when everyone's getting out and everyone's still kind of dripping and whatnot, I tend to, I tend to do a lean, which whenever you um, press that purge button uh, sort of underwater, water is gonna get inside of the bladder of your BCD. So you end up with a bit of um, sort of sea water or whatever water inside. So I usually lean so that it can all drain down to my bottom kidney dump and then just purge that uh, as I'm getting out to make sure that I get as much of that out as possible. But then when you go to, um, to clean it out, um, all you need to do, <clears throat> so this is just a wing. Uh, if you imagine the, the rest of the BCD attached, is um, you, you, get your, uh, you get your inflator, you get a freshwater hose pipe, and you're gonna aim that into the mouthpiece, hold down the purge button, and then that will allow water to go into the BCD. Only put, I don't know, half a liter or something. You don't need a lot in. Uh, if you do have some detergent available, yeah, use that. Something fairly um, non-abrasive. A lot of the manufacturers nowadays actually have a list. Uh, there is BCD specific stuff that you can get hold of. Uh, I'll try and find a, a link and pop it up here. Especially after um, sort of 2019 and everything that went on there, the manufacturers were going through, okay, well, we need to produce like safe lists of like detergents that you can use on your gear safely that isn't going to deteriorate the seals or the, or the hoses or any part of it, but it's safe and it can disinfect. Um, so yeah, they created lists. So have a look at your manufacturers if you just sort of Google your BCD manufacturer and their recommended list. Uh, if not, I'm gonna pop one up here, um, probably the Apex one, that was the most prominent when um, when I was searching for it back at the, uh, the beginning of like 2019, 20, um, 2020. Yeah, half a litre or something. Uh, give it a good like swish around so the water can get to all of the um, all of the corners of the BCD. Uh, and then I usually drain it out through a different valve um, just so that one, you, you know that this one works and it's nice and clean. You flushed out all of the um, sort of salt and stuff that could be around there by putting the water in. But then when I drain it, I do it through the other dump just so that any um, like salt or buildup around that ceiling surface can get some nice fresh clean water flushed through it. Uh, so yeah, just kind of hang it up as an angle so that that's at the lowest point, pull on the cable uh, and that, that flushes it out. But um, yeah, for, for most normal diving uh, in clean waters, I, I wouldn't do it between every single dive just because that's a bit of waste of, uh, of fresh water. But, um, but after, after a day's diving, uh, and especially before you're going to um, put it in like storage or anything, then I would uh, sort of wash it out nice and thoroughly, make sure it's nice and clean, uh, and then dry it out thoroughly. So I usually hang it up. Um, so that all the water can connect at the lowest point. I often do it um, upside down, to be honest, because then all the water collects at the bottom of this hose, uh, and then all you have to do is just press the purge button, uh, and all the water just drains out at the bottom. Um, and that's that's it, really. Um, yeah, I, I just use some um, some pretty mild household detergent, um, but there is some actual specific stuff that's designed for BCDs, antimicrobial, anti uh, sort of fungal stuff that's designed to uh, sort of kill any nasties. So the next time you come to your BCD, it's not just <sighs> nasty. And that's it for another week's of Ask Mark. Thank you so very much for all of your questions. Um, again, if you have any questions that you want me to elaborate on, let me know down in the comments below. And if you use the hashtag Ask Mark, it just makes it a lot easier for me to find them. Uh, I'm gonna pop as many links as possible for uh, sort of anything that I've spoken about uh, sort of in today's show down in the comments below. Uh, and there'll probably be some cards and little eye icons popping up in that corner. Um, but yeah, otherwise head over to simplyscuba.com. We do sell some 
some pretty interesting stuff. If you like my t-shirt, you can actually buy that. There's gonna be a banner underneath this video on YouTube. Uh, that will take you to our spring store where they'll make up one of these t-shirts or hoodies or something. Tank stickers, all sorts of stuff over there over on our spring store. Thank you for watching everybody. And of course, safe diving.